Welcome to Just Break Up, the podcast about love, heartbreak, and all the relationship advice you don't want to hear. My name is Sierra DeMolder. And I'm Sam Blackwell. And this week, we're going to tackle topics like hurting ourselves with the what ifs, defanging the sexless marriage, and handling when our friends' partners are jealous of us. Is it defanging or debanging the sexless relationship? (laughs) Nice one. Nice one. (laughs) Was it nice? (laughs) Was it? (laughs) I liked it. That's the only one. I'm the only one that matters. But before we begin, we just want to give you our Surgeon General's warning, which is that Sierra and I are not licensed mental health practitioners or people who have been formally trained in relationship advice giving. We are just two people. Period. (laughs) Period. That's (laughs) That's it. it. We're just two people. (laughs) Yep. That's it. Uh, This is all to say, please take our advice as you see fit. We're only here to offer our humble musings, so hopefully shed some understanding and maybe some laughs on the incredibly rewarding, but mostly confusing experience that is love. All right, Sam, do you want to tell me about the check-in topic? (laughs) I do. I do want to tell you about the check-in topic. Uh, So the check-in topic is inspired by... uh, uh, writer uh, whose name is Otto Ick Giver, whose pronouns are she, her, and who's writing from SF. Uh, and basically, um, Otto Ick Giver <laughs> had some whiskey and got, and her mind started <laughs> running and then her fingers got hot. And so she asked, wanted to ask us this question. Um, but it's about sort of the ick uh, and the ick sort of turned internally. So like when we see ourselves do something or when we say something that we think is silly or whatever it is, that sort of like immediate and like physical revulsion that we feel of like, Oh, I I don't like myself or like, Oh, that's disgusting or whatever it is. Um, and, and how do you address that? Like, what are some ways that that you can stop that in its tracks? Um, have Sierra and I ever given ourselves the ick? How do you deal with this, this thing that sort of, comes up and feels really uncontrollable, um, but also feels like really mean to ourselves. Now, you already told me this because I I needed to text you for clarification. (laughs) (laughs) But but Uh for those at home who are kindred with me, what is the ick? Yeah, so the ick is this sort of trend that folks are talking about, which is like, when our attraction to a person suddenly becomes a revulsion and we can't really explain why. So like most typically it's like talking about like you're on your third date and then he won't stop talking about his Apple watch. And suddenly it's like, oop, the <laughs> ick. <laughs> right. Or like you're on That's your so fourth mean. date, <laughs> right. You're on your fourth date and he like trips or something and you're like, Oh, and it's like, but it's like, a uncontrollable. <laughs> no, absolutely. They're all mean. Like it's not, I mean, sometimes it's, it's mean yeah. or sometimes it's like funny, but like, Often it's just like, oh, that poor person. But it's sort (laughs) of like, it's about like, it's not a logical thing. It's not like, oh, like here, but it's, it's like a, a like visceral sort of like body reaction of like, oh, I'm, it's not that I'm no longer attracted to that person. I'm like repulsed by them in this moment. Yeah. Um, So I think it makes sense that that's what the auto ick giver is calling that experience of being like, of like seeing yourself in a mirror or something and being like, Oh, what is, what's going on there? It's not like a logical, like, Oh, I need a haircut or something. It's like, Oh, like what's going on? Like that sort of body reaction to what we're seeing or what we're experiencing. Right. And so this is coming up when they say something that they perceive as dumb or when they do something that they regret or it's like, it's like retroactive social anxiety paired with self-loathing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Oh, and good, feels like good. We're out of, just out of so our control. kind to ourselves. <laughs> we are Man. so nice to ourselves. You know, Absolutely. you know what we have evolved through? Like, <laughs> you know so how much, much evolution took us to get here? And now we're like, let me evolve to hating myself more and in, and in more unique ways. <laughs> I have like, I want to like file a complaint. It's like, yes. Why did we evolve into this? This is yeah, not helpful. This like constant so anxiety and self-reflection. Like, what is this? It's not good. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So you told me privately that you strongly relate to this letter. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah. I'm, 
I get this feeling all the time of like you catch yourself in the mirror and you're like, oh, what is that? Or like you you say something on a podcast, for example, and <laughs> yeah, you're like, no kidding. God, <laughs> what an idiot. <laughs> or like, uh, yeah. Or or, you know, like you say something to a friend and you're like, oh, why did I say that? That, that was like such yeah. the wrong thing to say or whatever it is. Um, and I like deeply relate to this. And it. Um, and it's so interesting too, because it's like, you know, you can do a lot of work of like self-love and, and so much of that feels like a really intentional experience of like, yeah, I'm sitting down and I'm having these conversations, I'm doing this stuff. And yet like this, like visceral, like reptile brain revulsion, mm. <laughs> like comes up sometimes for me where I'm, where I play back what I said, or I listen to the sound of my own voice or whatever it is. And it's just like, oh, what is that? I totally relate to that. I think especially the how how subconscious it is mm, and how yeah. it's, it feels like a move in your brain that you that no amount of like self-love journaling <laughs> can can stop. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, it doesn't necessarily make sense. And it's like it's like a schoolyard bully that just like hides in the back of your brain for um, sure. and pops up just for these small things. Um, and how do you go about navigating this? When this letter came up and I sort of recognized that this is stuff that comes up in me, I immediately thought of that Alok Fedmedin um, interview on the Man Enough podcast where they sort of talked about people's revulsion towards them or whatever it is, is not about them. It's about the wound that those people have experienced around their own understanding of gender, gender expression, gender performance. And mm -hmm. um I think about that when I experience the ick, right? Where it's like, I recognize that it's coming up. And instead of just being like, Ugh, and then like running away, which I think is my natural impulse, like, oh, look at my, look at how ugly my hair looks in that mirror. And then like, just like walking away instead being like, whoa, pause, right? Like that was a big thing you just said to yourself. Like, where, where is that coming from? Like, what is yeah. the thing that you're like, where's the wound that needs to be tended? Um, and I think it's more about like, that stuff is going to come out all the time because we are all of us deeply wounded in many different ways. And that's going to come out in like really bizarre ways of, of treating ourselves and other people. So instead of just like allowing it to happen instead, like in the same way that I would with like a, like a, a child who is like unregulated, right. Instead of being like, yes. Oh, you're throwing that across the room. I'm just going to ignore it and like, let this happen instead being like, Whoa, 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 what's going on? Like what, oh my gosh, like you must be really upset. Like, let's talk about it. Like what is yes. the thing that's coming up for you or what is, why is this coming out in this way? Um, so, so treating myself like I would a child who's just lashed out at me. Cause that's what it sort of feels yes, like, right? Totally. Like you're, you're like your liminal, like lizard brain being like, ew, ew, ew. And it's like, yes. like, whoa, 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 whoa. Like, what do we need? Like, this isn't, this isn't helping you and it's not helping me. Like what do, what do we need in this situation? What needs to be different so that we can, we can regulate ourselves better. Yes. And isn't it wild all of the ways we have normalized or become desensitized to our own violent self-loathing like that you yeah. can have a thought that is so cruel and so, so passing, like, like passive, you know, like, mm -hmm. oh, look at that. My hair looks disgusting. The yep. word disgusting, like how often do we use that for other people and we use it so flippantly with ourselves? For sure. um, and, you know, the big thing that I'm taking from you now is like to denormalize that, to actually stand mm -hmm. in the truth of the, the way we're treating ourselves and 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 have have that have weight um, and have that have implications instead of punishing instead of flippantly going about saying like, oh, I look disgusting or I feel awful or man, mm -hmm. those people must hate me. Be like, whoa, 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 whoa. Those are big, meaningful things that I'm saying to myself about myself to myself. Yep. Where is that coming from? Who taught me that? Whose words were those first? And yep. why have I become so comfortable regurgitating them upon myself? For sure. And I also yeah. think like, you know, I remember reading on Instagram years ago, uh, every time I judge something, I reveal an unhealed part of myself. Right. And that goes to the bigger idea of ick, right? <laughs> what are you so disgusted by right now? You know, not, for sure. not I'm, I'm definitely for people, you know, cueing into their more into their senses of self or into their intuition when it comes to dating. And if you really don't like that guy who talked about his Apple watch for three hours, Great. like trust that ick, ride that ick. And also, <laughs> 
I feel like our judgment on other people is is a false sense of security, and that mm. and that's the same for our judgment of ourselves. For sure, absolutely. And these like ick moments are often also so tied to like systems of oppression yes. that we have learned and that we engage in as well, right? So like there is something to be said about sitting in those things and being like, where is this coming from? Rather than just yes. being like, Ooh, I got the ick, right? And being like, okay, I got right. the ick, but, but what part of me is unhealed and is like so repulsed by literally just another human being who's standing in front of me. Right. Exactly. All right, my darling, darlings, we hope that this helps. Let's get into our letters for this week's episode. Let's do it. All right. Our first letter comes to us from X. Austed, whose mm. pronouns are she, her, who is writing to us from The Void. Hi, Sam and Sierra. Thank you for all that you do. I never miss an episode, and I'm so grateful for the head and heart work I've been able to do because of this podcast. I, 25, cis, het, female, have had a history of dating guys who kept in touch with their exes. This contact would eventually turn inappropriate, resulting in general discomfort slash doubt and sometimes even cheating. Because of this pattern, I had developed some paranoia about exes i started dating my current boyfriend let's call him h 25 cis het male about a year ago it's been a great fulfilling relationship which in which i feel seen heard and taken care of we now live together and i have tangibly seen my life change for the better since dating this person however there is something that has continued to haunt me a few months into our relationship, my still paranoid self gave into my darker impulses and I checked H's phone. I know that was very toxic and I wish I hadn't done it. Unfortunately, I found what I was looking for. H had contacted his ex the day before our second date, saying that he was sorry, that she meant a lot to him, that she was beautiful, and that he wanted to try again. Needless to say, I began questioning everything. One of my biggest triggers had been activated and I went into an emotional spiral. I never confronted him about it directly. He had made some comparisons between me and his ex at the beginning of dating and I told him that it wasn't right or fair and he stopped. Time passed and I feel 95% secure in this relationship now. Still, the thought will creep into my head that if she said yes, H and I wouldn't be together now. It also makes me doubt things because I feel like I am a second choice. Mm. H has been nothing but dedicated and attentive to me and our relationship, and I feel lucky to be with him. I haven't checked his phone since, and I trust him absolutely in the present. I'm, I was wondering if you could both offer me a perspective that will help me let go of this and move forward. Love, exhausted. Mm. I love this question and I love the way you phrased it that like, that really you just want to look at this differently so you could move on, that you know that this is in the past and that you can't change anything, um, but you want to be able to move into the future, like not carrying the baggage of this or the anxiety of this, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it's so relatable. Yeah, and before we dig in, I just want to say that like, you're having a 95% success rate of staying <laughs> secure in this relationship, <laughs> which like to me is like pretty good, <laughs> right? Like that's like a, I think that a, a percentage that many of us would aim for in our relationships. So I do want to just like give you credit for the ways in which you have um, found a way to trust yourself and trust your partner and move past this. And right. I also just want to say that like, getting rid of that last 5% um, is something that may not even happen, right? Because I, mm. you know, like like Sierra and I have talked about many times, like this stuff just comes up sometimes, right? The narratives that we've learned, the stuff that we have internalized into ourselves. Um, and so I, I want to just say that the goal isn't necessarily to get to 100% of the time I am never doubting our relationship <laughs> and instead say 95% amazing. That is such a good way to be in relationship with somebody. And in that other 5%, when these doubts are coming up, what are we doing to remind ourselves that we are choosing to be in this relationship, that the, our partner has chosen us to be in relationship with? Like, how are we going to react and respond when these things come up? Not necessarily like get rid of all of these feelings, get rid of all of these thoughts, because that's not actually something that we can achieve because it those right. thoughts, those feelings we are going to come up mm -hmm. always. They're 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 built into the bodies that we are sitting in. 
I'm thinking about the origin stories of so many love loves that I know, um, my, mine included. Um, and while yes, there are relationships out there that have started with two wholly single people, <laughs> you know, coming to each other with such a clean slate, perfectly timed, you know, perfect amount of, you know, matching baggage. <laughs> <laughs> right. I know that those exist. And also the majority of relationships in the beginning of them, there is always some sort of untangled, sorry, there is always some sort of tangled thread that needs to be sorted out or mm -hmm. there's something that needs to be unraveled or there's peace that needs to be made or like, you know, I'm thinking about the circumstances in which people have had long, they, you know, they thought they weren't over, for, over their ex and then they meet somebody else and that gives them a, a sharper perspective or that gives mm -hmm. them closure or it distracts them long enough to realize that they don't actually miss their ex. They miss being in a relationship or whatever. Um, we, the beginning the beginnings of our love stories are not indicative of the quality of them long term um, yep. or or their value overall. And I know this is let me just say this is so easily anxiety inducing. <laughs> this, <laughs> I remember sure. once dating somebody who told me that they broke. He told me that he had broken up with his ex x amount of months ago but it like wasn't lining up with the mm -hmm. stories that he was telling me sure sure and sure. i did some digging of my own and realized that it did. was like <laughs> realized that it was like three weeks before we had dated versus like several like months you know <laughs> but i remember being like well this changes everything you know <laughs> i mean that does change everything <laughs> <laughs> well yeah because he lied to me yeah. and you know, he, yeah, whatever. That was not the right relationship to begin with. An origin story like this does not mean it's not a good relationship. Right. Um, and it, it really forces us to ignore, if not, maybe not ignore, but like to quiet those anxious, the anxious mewing <laughs> in mm -hmm. our brain to be able to truly hear the peace and clarity and health of the relationship now. Yeah. Um, and guess what? Like maybe they... I want to speak a little bit to your fear about being a second choice or like, what if she had said yes? Right. Um, if you want to think that way, you're going to drive yourself bonkers because there are a million path pathways for us, for our lives to take, for you know, sure. <laughs> I stuttered like eight times in that sentence. <laughs> Make take, uh, um, <laughs> maybe they would be together in, in a different lifeline. Yeah, absolutely. A different timeline, right? Mm -hmm. um, in the multiverse of your relationship. Thank you. There right? we go. Like <laughs> yes, in the multiverse. Maybe they are together, but if they are together, then you don't have this sort of relationship with him. You only went on two dates. Right. Or one date. And and right. he's not the significant person he is to you now. You And you, second choice, being a second choice doesn't really exist because there are a million other choices. We are always the first or last or second or third or fifth choice in somebody's life. Sure. You could be a second choice to like a car accident that he did or did not get into that day, you know? <laughs> sure. Yeah. It's really dark. Um, but I'm just saying like, <laughs> I think that the, our, our, our monogamous culture that loves to, make our partners into sort of this purity property that we that have to be clean and pure and only want us and only have been with us mm. it really can confuse our brains when we are quote the second thing that they wanted right but that but that is undermining our entire humanity we're allowed to want so many things you know and plus like long story short he's with you <laughs> And I think it's important when you're like looking at this to not be like, I'm his second choice, right? You can look back and say, I was his second choice, but guess what? He didn't know me, <laughs> right? Like you had been right. on one date when he was like, one I date. would rather be with this ex-girlfriend of mine. Who he right? knew intimately and he didn't know Absolutely. you intimately yet. And he didn't know you at all, right? So even if you were second choice to him, that's because he's an idiot who didn't know you, right? Like he's not I, an idiot, Samuel. <laughs> he was he was an idiot in that point because, like, of course yeah, you should be it. you should be first pick. <laughs> but I, I think 
it's important for us to re- like for you to remember in the situation that we're not talking about you and your boyfriend right now, right? We're not talking about the love and the time and the energy that you've put into this relationship and getting to know each other, right? Like he had an option of this person he knew really well or this person he'd been on one date with and he was like I'm in love with this person that I that I knew know very well, but that doesn't mean anything about you because he didn't know you. It's not like he had some sort of secret knowledge that said like, oh, I know for a fact that my ex-girlfriend will be better than this person, right? Like he wasn't he was a person making choices with a limited amount of information about you and about what your posi- your relationship could possibly look like. Right. So, so it doesn't behoove you, it doesn't serve you well to make this comparison or this sort of hierarchy uh, because it's not actually true. It's the, yeah. the way that you're experiencing it or the way that you're talking about it isn't an actual reflection of what happened in those moments. And what I love about our anxiety <laughs> is so fun is that it gets focused on things that like we can't change and also didn't don't really matter that much, <laughs> right? Which is exactly <laughs> what's happening here, right? You can't change the fact that he back a year ago before he knew anything about you besides like your name and what you did, what you do for work and like how well you can hold a conversation. Right. Like going back there, you can't change that. Right. Like this thing that he did a year ago and guess what? It doesn't actually matter that much because he's with you. Right. Like, yeah, maybe what would have happened if she'd said yes, who cares and who knows, right? Like it didn't yeah. happen. She didn't say yes. And so now you are together in this beautiful, wonderful relationship, this supportive and loving thing that you two are embarking on together. And so the question for you is like, when this kind of like anxiety stuff comes back, how can you bring yourself back to what is actually true, which is that you and he are both choosing to be together in this moment? Right. There are many different things, many different circumstances that have led you to this, including the situation with his ex. But in this moment, you two have decided that this is the relationship that you want. And how beautiful and wonderful is that of the seven billion people in the world that you two have found a way to decide that you want to be together for now and going into the future? Oh, Samuel being so poetic. (laughs) All right, my sweet. We hope that this at least offers one new perspective to help you (laughs) let this go and move on um, in a way that feels better for you. Thank you so much for writing and trusting us with this letter. Absolutely. We love you. All right. Our next letter comes from River Tam, whose pronouns are she, her, who's writing from No Sex USA. (laughs) Dear Sam and Sierra, first, I am a huge fan of the pod and love the work that you do. Thank you for keeping us all sane in this insane world of love and relationships. Okay, now to my conundrum. I am married to my partner, he, him, for several years now. When our relationship started, we had the most amazing sex. Like, for real, a man never made me come before him. So it was really great. Over time, our relationship blossomed into a really loving and supportive one. And I can truly say that he is my best friend. However... There, here comes the other side. We have been together for over seven years now and the sex has disappeared. Like basically completely. Sometimes we will have short periods of time like last summer where we had sex every day, but we were on vacation and away from the stresses and routine of daily life. Since then, it has happened once. For reference, it is coming up on Christmas. I am in my early 30s and I'm a very sexual person and the lack of sex in this relationship has made me question the entire marriage. I have brought this up to him many, many times over the years, but at this point, it's something that has almost become a joke between us and he no longer takes the conversations really seriously. To be fair, in the evenings, sometimes I also don't feel in the mood, but I would say that the major problem is that no one is initiating it. Also, I am always the one who brings up discontent with this, which also makes me upset as I feel like he doesn't care that we don't have an intimate relationship anymore. This also puts a general stress on our relationship and I become much more easily annoyed at him for small things. Really healthy, I know. Also, fun side note, I have started to have very vivid dreams where I cheat on my partner because of an internal dialogue going on in the dream that there is no sex in my relationship, so I have to find it somewhere else. I then usually wake up feeling really guilty, even though it was just a dream, lol. Basically, what I'm trying to say is that I love my partner so much, but I feel so sad at at such a loss of what to do to make the sexual part of our relationship come back to life. 
It needs some serious resurrecting, but I don't feel like he puts any effort into it. And I get so frustrated that I feel like giving up sometimes. I also have this internal shame around this, and I don't feel like I can talk to any of my friends or family about it mm. since I feel like they will judge me or say that this is not normal, etc. I start to wonder if it is the beginning of the end of my marriage, which makes me deeply sad. However, I have a fear of being in a sexless marriage for my whole life with no one brave enough to make a change. Sorry for this rant. I hope it is not too all over the place. Thank you so much for reading this. Much love, River. Oh, River, thank you so much for trusting us with this question and for listening. This is, I just want to say out the gate is this is very normal this oh, is very not like a shameful secret that would you know spread would be like town gossip you know For i sure. feel like if the gossip wheel got a hold of this one everyone would be like oh yeah totally relatable <laughs> <laughs> yeah i was like that yep <laughs> yeah keeping in mind that like every relationship looks different every person has a different relationship to sexuality desire and even the most compatible uh, most stable, secure relationships, they still have misaligned desires and needs because we, like I said, we all have different relationships to intimacy. Um, so there's just not, I just want to start by saying this is totally normal and there's not a right or wrong way to have sex in a relationship because we have so many, we're, we're all so uh, inconsistent <laughs> and diverse in our, in our relationship to sex and intimacy. And I also want to say this letter really speaks to me um, because one of the things that intimidates me most about marriage and partnership in general is how difficult it can be to change an established, comfortable dynamic, even when that dynamic is like comfortable in a bad way, you know, like just going to bed at night when you're sure. tired instead of making that intimacy bid. Um Changing those established dynamics can be so difficult. It can feel impossible um, because, especially in long-term relationships, um, you you become so at ease. You really you establish your routines, your comfort zones, and you and maybe vulnerability goes up during that time. But then I think, and forgive me, this is my first time like trying to articulate something about this. Is that like? The vulnerability of a long-term partnership can often turn into some sort of anti-vulnerability <laughs> because sure. you become safe in that shell of routine. You know, mm. you 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 become you become sort of restricted by the the pre-established dynamics or roles. And you feel like you're so comfortable in in, in them or, or that path is so well worn that it's really hard to break out of that and do something new, especially because in something like this, it requires us to often put our own discomfort second. And that discomfort can be our embarrassment, our, our shame, our fear of putting ourselves out there, especially in sex, like how uncomfortable it can be to be like, I need intimacy with you, like intimacy with you. This can't be a joke anymore. Like. Let's have sex, you know, <laughs> For sure. um, it can, be, you know, we can really be afraid of looking stupid or, or it can feel very inorganic is what I'm trying to say. So I just want to thank you for this letter and tell you that this is all normal and incredibly relatable. Um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I would encourage you to think about, read about, um, go to therapy or, or a couple's therapist that is, um, trained in, um, sex therapy because I think when it comes to sex in, and this is true of like a lot of different things, but it's like, we're all sort of expected to have the right words, tools, oh self-awareness, so self-understanding, and just be able to like navigate things without any help, which is like so silly because there, like, there are so many things where it's like, are we all expected to know how to cook without a cookbook, <laughs> right? Like, are we all expected, <laughs> right? Are we all expected to know how to like make a pie without like having someone tell us what the ingredients of the pie are? And so having these types of conversations with each other without like the tools, without the language, without like shared understanding of what we're talking about can be so, so tricky and can lead to additional shame around it. Right. Cause it's like, exactly. Oh, well I talked about it and they didn't get it. So there must be something wrong with me or it could lead to the other thing, which can turn into resentment. Right. We talked about it and they didn't get it. So there must be something wrong with them. Right. So like what, what are the ways that you can, you and he 
can build your ability to talk about what your sex drives look like and how, what are some ways that you two can agree to try things and make agreements about them, right? Like as an example, right, when we talked to Casey Tanner, the queer sex therapist um, and the podcast host of Safe Word, right, they introduced me to the concept of spontaneous uh, arousal versus reactive arousal, which is like, mm -hmm. and when I learned this, I was like, oh my God, I am a responsively aroused person. I don't experience spontaneous, right? Where spontaneous is like, you look at something attractive and you're like, oh, I'm horny. Whereas like responsive <laughs> is like, if somebody makes a pass at you or like tries to initiate, then it's like, it sort of takes a little bit of time to build up, but you're like, yes. you get to a point where you're excited about it. And I, and I'm so thankful for that conversation with Casey because it like transformed the shame I had around myself about the like I'm doing this sex thing wrong. And instead being like, right. oh, I have different ways to understand and talk about what actually works for me to actually get me to a point where I'm like ready to have sex. <laughs> and right. so that's my encouragement for you. Like, what are some things that you can read about, listen to? I'm sure that Casey's actually, I'm not sure. I know for a fact that Casey's podcast is amazing and you should check it out. Cause I'm sure that there's stuff in there that will be helpful for you. Yes. But it is important for us to like, not just approach these conversations thinking that they will go well just because, <laughs> but instead being like, what are the tools out there? Do we need to go see an ASEX accredited uh, therapist, right? People who right. are, who are trained in sex therapy do what books can I read about arousal? Check one off <laughs> on the tally, uh, Spencer, cause, uh, ACE is a great <laughs> book to read about, uh, different types of, uh, how we approach sex and different ideas around like, what do we assume is the norm? What do we assume is not the norm? And what do we actually want? Like there's so much work that needs to go in this. And I'm, what I'm hearing is that your, your husband doesn't seem to be wanting to do that. But I think in combination with Sierra sort of like disrupting the pattern of the way that you talk about this and then thinking about what are the tools that we need to be able to talk about this with some shared understanding of our own stuff and each other's stuff, because right. talking about this in the way that you're talking about it isn't super constructive, right? It's just sort of repeating the same pattern. So how are you disrupting that pattern? And then how are you building up your capacity to be able to talk about this in a way that's going to be helpful for both of you? All right, my darling. I hope that all made sense. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> and we love you so much. Thank you so much for writing. We hope this helps. All right. Our last letter comes to us from Frankly Uncomfortable, whose pronouns are she, her, who is writing to us from apparently still Xville. Hmm. Dear Sam and Sierra, first of all, I want to thank you and Spencer so much for the way you've touched my life and the lives of so many others. I first found your podcast in the depths of the pandemic, and it has played an important and active role in the growth I've done from then to now. Thank you for all that you put out into the world. That is very kind. You are well. welcome. All right. I, 23, female, she, her, write to you today, not necessarily with a problem of my own, but with questions about a problem my friend is managing and how I should or should not handle it. My best friend from college, will call them A, 22, non-binary, and they use they, them pronouns, wants to return to the city we attended college in to visit me. A fairly normal activity, I'd say. However, their girlfriend, she, they, is extremely upset that they want to visit me because A and I dated briefly two years ago. This is resulting in a likely postponement of the trip. A has been really upfront and honest with their girlfriend about our past since the beginning of their relationship. Re reality is we dated. It didn't work out. We worked to rebuild our pre-existing friendship after the breakup and have been healthily just friends again for about a year, far before the girlfriend came into the picture. Regardless of the girlfriend, A and I have absolutely no romantic interest in each other at this point. We're just friends and everyone in our friend group who has seen the evolution of our relationship knows that A's girlfriend has nothing to worry about frankly i used to forget that we were technically even exes until a's girlfriend started making it a problem now it's relevant again i've even met a's girlfriend and spent a weekend with them and our friends it seemed normal until the girlfriend has been making her distaste towards my friendship with a known more recently their girlfriend even admits that the issue isn't me or my relationship with a it's past trauma their girlfriend previous 
their girlfriend their girlfriend's previous partner ha- have cheated on her with exes. I like Ace girlfriend and was very supportive of this relationship until she began to start to control our friendship, even going so far as to ask A to never mention my name. A and I were attached at the hip throughout college, so this is a huge ask that requires A to filter a massive part of their life. Apparently, one of the things that A's girlfriend is holding on to is the fact that A and I had a threesome with a friend of ours during a festival a year plus after our breakup. It was spontaneous, but honestly was light and fun and not at all romantic. It was a bucket list item that was checked off during a festival where people do wild things for the sake of it. Sure. Those festivals. It's funny. I never went to a festival. Is that what yeah, you call me that? Either. <laughs> I got that bucket list though. <laughs> it is n- <laughs> it has never messed with the dynamic of our friendship since that and that is the only context in which we have been intimate in. This was long before A's girlfriend was in the picture and while I get it may be difficult to wrap one's head around the fact that it was not romantic, I feel like the girlfriend has got to be able to trust that A trust A that it was just for fun. It's difficult to filter your behaviors for future someone that isn't even in your life yet. But maybe I'm looking at this incorrectly. I don't know. Some help here would be great, LOL. I know that A is in a tough position. They want to talk through these insecurities with their girlfriend, but their girlfriend won't talk about it without getting upset to an unproductive level. We have been talking about this trip for quite a while. It's I tried to book flights today, but their girlfriend wouldn't. Sorry. A tried to book flights today, but their girlfriend wouldn't talk about it and ask for some space. So now we can't book this trip. This seems manipulative to me. I feel very strange in this situation, as if I've done something wrong simply by being A's friend and in their life. I'm also growing concerned about the dynamic in my friend's relationship, as it seems unhealthy. And I am growing concerned about the future of our friendship within this dynamic a made it very clear to their girlfriend that they won't stop being friends with me there is really no reason to but i am growing increasingly uncomfortable with the situation what uh, to say to my friend about their girlfriend since the issue is related to me and generally unsure of how to be tread here Am I doing something wrong by wanting to be friends with A slash are they doing something wrong for wanting to visit me? What do I say or not say to A about the relationship and the situation? Generally, how do I move forward from here? Thank you for all that you do. Again, best, frankly, uncomfortable. All right, frankly, thank you so much for writing. Um, And I thought this letter was interesting because we often get sort of letters about people in relationships um, where the partner or they are feeling like really sort of jealous of the a friend who is also an ex. Um, And we very rarely hear from the perspective of that ex friend. (laughs) Yeah, Uh, yeah. (gasps) So it it was uh, I appreciate that you trusted us with this letter. And um, and I think it's really a tricky situation for you to be in because it's not your relationship, right? Like it's not, you know, you could sort of look at it and be like, if you were in A's shoes and be like, oh, this isn't, I don't want to be in a relationship where I can't be with my friend, but it's so much harder to be on the outside and be like, oh, I see my friend being put in this uncomfortable position and like, I want to be supportive and also I don't want them to not be my friend anymore. So where, how do I, how am I supposed to navigate that situation? So um, I'm sorry that you're in this pickle, um, and and I hope that we're able to offer you some perspective on on what you could be doing in this situation. Yeah, I I feel for everybody in here because I feel for you as this sort of bystander who's really afraid that your friend is your friendship is going to change irrevocably or be taken away from you. Mm. Um, I feel for your your friend, A, because like this is a really uncomfortable, difficult position to be in because it's like pitting one relationship against another in a weird, um, I don't know, how, how would you describe this? Like uh, ownership way or this is so relatable, like this fear of the ex, you know, definitely I experience it, but it's it's like retroactive jealousy, I guess. <laughs> yeah, um, for sure. And I actually feel for the girlfriend because I know that there's a wound here, as we always say. <laughs> right. um, so I feel for everybody in the situation because there's a lot of like 
conditioned stress that's happening here as well as like real interpersonal stress you know the fear of losing this relationship from all lens you know i want to start by saying that you know i think you know this already but ultimately this is not up to you we can just hope that your friend draws boundaries to protect both of their relationships you know, and you can advocate for such. You can say, like, this seems a little, you know, out of left field for the, your girlfriend to be asking you to do this. Or how do mm -hmm. you how does it make you feel when she asks you not to visit? You know, you can be curious, you can be compassionate. But unfortunately, this is a dynamic um, in their relationship that you cannot you're not the one that's going to establish it. I think, you know, that from what you've said in the letter. Um, but I also want to say um, the threat might here's just another perspective for you to under to maybe just gleam some more understanding about this i'm not sure the threat is that you were in a relationship once like you keep saying like we're not romantically interested in each other we, we don't want to be together you know the the threesome had nothing to do with romance i'm guessing if i had to take a stab in the dark i'm guessing the threat is the sex is the idea that this person once desired you sure. and i've talked about it on the show where i've had my own insecurities about accepting that my partner is able to like desire more than one person that doesn't lessen their desire for me that they can that, that nobody's going to come to you with a clean slate um and and the why i'm offering that perspective is not to justify it. Like I've worked through those feelings and the girlfriend is going to have to work through them too, because she's never going to date anybody with a clean slate. Um, and it's not reasonable to ask a, to just erase their past or their present friendship, you know, right. but I offer yeah. that because like maybe then you can stop trying to reassure this person or a, that like there's nothing romantic going on. And then instead it's the, the, the thing is I'm not going to, you know, a is not going to cheat on you. We're not sexually interested in each other anymore. I don't know. I don't know what it is. I feel like for sure I'm rambling but a little because you're in such a tricky position. Yeah. And it's not your job to explain to the girlfriend that that's something that's not going to happen. Right. Cause it's not your relationship. Um, even as you are obviously a sort of um, interdependent, right? Because the relationship, their relationship affects your relationship as well. But I, I do think that um, the problem is, is that like there, the thing that's causing you this pain is like so much is so outside of your control. And the only thing that you can do is choose how you react and respond to the way that A speaks to you towards the dynamics that you're seeing. Um, and I would encourage you to talk with a about, um, the fact that this is like hard for you to, to see and experience, right. That they're not necessarily doing anything wrong, but that being put in this position is like making you pretty uncomfortable and tell them that, you know, you love and support them in whatever they want to do. Um, but, but this is definitely having a big impact on, on your relationship with them, right. To say, yeah, you are, you get to decide how this relationship goes for you. And also like, I'm definitely feeling some of the the impacts of it and it's making me uncomfortable. And also it's making me sad for you that you're being put in this position. So what can I do to help support you in this? Yes. And it's, it's sad to say that like sometimes friendships don't stand the test of time, right? Sometimes friendships, because the circumstances that they're existing in are no longer supportive of those friendships, right? Because we are all dependent on context. We're all dependent on timelines. Sometimes those things don't go very well. And sometimes relationships, friendships have to break up. Sometimes they get back together, right? There's an ebb and flow in, in sort of how we interact with other people and how we maintain our relationships with them. And I, um, it makes me sad to say that, right? Because I wish I could be like, right. here's the here's the five things you can do to make sure that this friendship works for you. Um, but it sucks to be in this position where you're sort of seeing your friend be put in a in an uncomfortable position and knowing that that might have broad implications on on you and not really feel like there's anything that you can can do about it. So yeah, how are you? 
talking about it? How are you taking care of yourself in this situation? Um, but this isn't something that you need to necessarily sweep under the rug. This is something that you can continue to have conversation with A about to help them understand the ways in which this relationship that they're currently in with this current girlfriend and your relationship are, are interdependent. They are, they depend on each other. They are influenced by yeah. each other. You're definitely not doing anything wrong, though. And A no. isn't either. We just affirm that, that like, especially as we get older, the world is a lot smaller than we think. And there is there is going to always be overlap. And I know Sam and I always joke to like block your exes and don't be friends with your exes. And we say that glibly, like glibly. <laughs> For sure. Can I, is that yeah. the right? Absolutely. Um, and there are obviously you know, exceptions to that. <laughs> right, exactly. And um, the best of which are like you described, where you actually forget that you were exes once, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and unfortunately, it's, it's just something that A is going to have to navigate. But just to reiterate something, while this is not on you, I totally agree with Sam that, that, that there, that you can keep bringing this up. You can check in about their, you know, your friend's relationship, you can be a support to them. But what I just want to articulate is that there's going to, there has to be two levels to this. There has to be two different approaches. The one approach is you being a supportive and curious and compassionate friend that offers resources, perspective, and is patient, you know, because it's not your relationship, it's theirs. And the other level of this is the person that Sam was just referencing that may already be preemptively grieving this relationship changing because of circumstances out of your control. How are you taking care of yourself? How are you advocating for yourself? Like, this might not be your relationship, but you can say like, hey, A, I feel like it's really unfair that your girlfriend is threatening to take away this very special time for us. How can I support you in this? You know, like mm -hmm. striking that balance between being true to yourself, um, protecting your own, own energy and peace and, and trying to preserve your relationships while understanding that you can't act in their relationship. You can't be the, right. the, the voice. Um, unfortunately we can't control other people. We can just support them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, this is tricky and we know, um, what a headache it is, but please know that we have been there. We totally understand this and that we hope, we hope that the tides change on this because, um, like I said before, this is going to happen again. If the, if A and your their girlfriend break up, like the girlfriend's going to have to deal with this again. A is going to deal with this again. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this is this is a part of navigating adult relationships. For sure. Absolutely. Because we've all got a history. All right, my darling, we, we hope this helps. Thank you so much for writing. We love you. We love you. All right, this brings us to the blind date segment of the show. Every episode, we like to shout out something that we love that we want to set you up with. And this week, we are sending you home with an app called Forest. Uh, it is a concentration app. So uh, what's really cute about it is that you sort of set a timer on it and you say, okay, I'm going to work for the next 20 minutes. And then if you don't look at your phone in that 20 minutes, it grows a little tree. So then you can like sort of look uh, at your forest and see how many times you've concentrated on things. Um, I find it really helpful as somebody who is like very easily distracted and also very addicted to my phone to be able to say like, okay, I'm going to take an intentional 20 minute break from it, or I'm going to be doing this thing and concentrating on this thing for 40 minutes. And as somebody who like needs a little friction between me and my phone often, this adds like the perfect amount of friction for me to be like, well, if I look at my phone, I'm going to kill that tree. So I want to be able to, <laughs> and I'm going to make my, my forest not as lush. So it's like the, it's really helpful for me to, to at least have something between me and just like picking up my phone and starting to scroll. So, uh, it does cost like $3, but I would say that it's worth it. Um, so you can find it on the app stores. Uh, I think it's on, it's definitely on Apple and I believe it's also on Android. So, uh, it's called forest. It's a concentration helping tool. All awesome. right, everyone. Thank you so much for listening. You can like us on Facebook and you can follow us on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, TikTok, all of the things at just break up pod. You can slide into our DM, send us your favorite relationship memes, but most importantly, you can submit your questions about all matters of the heart at justbreakuppod.com, which is also where you can find our merchandise. 
Please remember to follow and subscribe. Give us a five-star rating and review and consider supporting us on Patreon. If you support us on Patreon for as little as $5 a month, you'll get an additional bonus weekly episode as well as access to our back catalog of over a hundred episodes. That's patreon.com slash just break up pod. This literally keeps our mics on and helps us reach more brokenhearted souls who need two random strangers giving them relationship advice. Just Break Up is a production of Duvid Media, original music, recording, editing, producing all magical things by our good friend Spencer Worth Davis. Make sure to check out his most recent podcast. Dang, that's weird. And remember, you are allowed to practice patience and loving kindness for everyone you encounter while upholding your own boundaries, practicing that same loving kindness and patience on yourself. Everyone is doing the best that they can with what they have at this moment, and that includes you. And if all else fails, just break up.